Morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Wednesday Luke study. We're in Luke chapter 7 and verse 11, where we're at. Before we get started, let's have ourselves a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for all you do for us. We pray at this time that you'd be with Marguerite and her family and all of those people that were affected by the tragedy that just recently happened. We pray that you would comfort them only as you know how. We ask that you'd be with those that we mentioned as being sick or need a prayer. We pray that you'd bless them and give them whatever they need, whether it's physical uh, comfort or health or spiritual comfort or health. Uh, we ask, Father, that you would be with uh, all of us as we strive to be better servants of yours. Help us to glorify you and honor you and to uh, better understand your will so that we might know you and that we might find favor in your sight. We ask that you forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are looking at Luke chapter 7. And, of course, this is part of what's referred to as the um, Sermon on the Plain. And you should have received your second little booklet, which covers chapters 7 through chapters 12, so that you can have a little, a little stuff to kind of help you in, in previewing and in thinking about what we're going to be covering. In chapter 7 of Luke, we're going to be, we already talked about the healing of the centurion servant. Today we're going to look at Jesus raising the young man uh, from the dead, and John asking Jesus about whether he's the Messiah, and Jesus talking to us about who John is. And a parable about forgiveness of sin is what we're going to notice today. And uh, if we get uh, further than that, then we'll get into chapter 8. That's what we're going to be looking at. Now, uh, make sure that you do your, your questions that are on, on there. I don't know whether Laredo is going to be covering some of those or doing something different, but make sure that whatever you, uh, uh, whatever questions are there that you take care of so that you can, so that you can um, help him in the process of teaching. We pray, we, we appreciate Brother Laredo teaching next week, and I'm going to be going on Wednesday in the morning, and we appreciate Bill and Greg and all those who, who fill in, and that's really good because what that means is you don't need me, and that's a good thing. Uh, all right, so we are in Luke chapter 7. Uh, we have just noticed that Jesus had finished uh, basically telling them the, the heart, if I can put it that way, of the Sermon on the Mount basically trying to teach them that they're supposed to be like, they're supposed to be God's people, and so they're supposed to act accordingly. They're supposed to love their enemies. They're supposed to be willing to give. They're willing to share. Uh, we're, we're not to be people who are quick to uh, injure others or even injure others, but we're, we're to love one another, and we're to demonstrate the qualities that, that God wants us to have. We're not to be people who think that we're worthy of getting to heaven, uh, but that we hunger and thirst for righteousness, and that we're willing to mourn over our sins and recognize our sins and do our best to turn away from them as we rely on Jesus to take care of us. And so we're supposed to be merciful as our Heavenly Father is merciful. And so after that, uh, he then told them that you, you're going you're gonna to be building your house on something. We all build our house on something. You're either going to build it on the rock or you're going to build it on the sand. And Jesus and Luke are trying to point out for us in chapter 7 that Jesus is the rock. You can build your life on him. You can build your life on him because he's able to heal the, the centurion servant with just a word. So God's word, uh, you, can, you can build your life on because it will happen. It does have authority or the right to work in our life. And so we get to the second miracle that Luke lists for us after the Sermon on the Plain. And it says in Luke 7 and verse 11, Soon afterwards he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the, and the bears came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his, to his mother. Fear, fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report concerning him went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding districts. And, and so what we have is Jesus then comes to, to, to Nain in verse 11, it says, soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him. And so you can see Jesus as he is going through this, through, uh, this town or going, getting ready to go into this town. 
he's getting ready to walk into it, that there's a crowd following him, as you can imagine. Uh, like any, any popular individual today, if they're in town, there'd be all these people following him and, or following her and, and trying to see, see them or, or trying to, to visit with them or ask them questions or whatever. So you'd have this big crowd of people, and, and they're coming into the city. And coming out of the city, it says in verse 12, now, as he approached the, the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. So you see two different groups of people. One group of people is coming into the city. Another group of people is getting ready to go out of the city. The people that are coming into the city are following Jesus, and it's not Jesus' custom for people to be sad with him. So they're, they're not coming mourning or mournful or 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 sad uh, so you have this one crowd that's coming rather rather happy or, or excited that the that Jesus with them and you have this one crowd that's coming the other way that's sad and mournful uh, because of the loss of a son it's a funeral and they're coming out and so one's going out of the city one's coming into the city the reason one's going out of the city is because they wouldn't bury their people in the city because people who would pass by the, the grave would become unclean. So they, had, they generally buried people outside the city is where they would bury them uh, in the caves and in the, in the hills and various places. They would bury them. And that's why Jesus talked about the fact that the, that the, the <clears throat> Pharisees, he sometimes described as whitewashed tombs. And the reason they would paint the tombs white, especially during, during times of celebration, is so that nobody would touch them, because you wouldn't want to touch them. So outside, they looked rather pretty. They're painted white. They're whitewashed. But that's so that you don't go near them, uh, and, and because you would be considered unclean. So there's one group that's coming out of the city because they're unclean, as they're carrying this dead person out. And there's one group that's coming in that's very clean. And so you got to see these two different groups of people as they're coming, and they kind of meet at the gate of the city. Okay, and that's where they meet. Verse 12, now as he was approaching the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of, a, of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. So apparently, she was a very popular lady, or at least her son was a very popular individual. He had a lot of people that were following him. Uh, a lot of times, people will be buried, and there'll only be a few people at the, at the funeral because either they weren't very nice or or they didn't really get out and associate with people, and individuals didn't really know them. But this, uh, this individual had a large crowd. So there was a large crowd that knew this individual, whether they knew his mother or whether they, they knew the son, there was a large crowd. <clears throat> and it says that his mother was a widow, and this was her only son. And so in that day and time, if you were a widow and you didn't have any children, you were about as destitute as destitute could be. Uh, because any property wouldn't be in your name. It would be in the name of your family or in the name of your son. And that's one of the reasons why in the Old Testament uh, you were supposed to uh, have a son. And if, if you didn't have a son uh, or you died before your wife had a son, that your brother was to take her and have a, a son so that he could then be the, the heir of their, their property. So the reason I'm telling you all that is just for you to understand how destitute this widow, this widow would have been. She would have been extremely destitute. Uh, and so they're approaching this city, and, and the crowds meet, and the crowd is with her. And, and it says, and when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. So as Jesus saw this, he felt compassion. And no doubt, this isn't the only funeral that Jesus ever saw. But he had compassion for this one. And I would suggest to you that the reason he had compassion for this one is because he understood what was going to happen to the widow. He understood that this widow wouldn't have any means of support, wouldn't be able to take care of herself, and so therefore he's, he needs to have some compassion on her. Uh, you're, you're not too sad if a, uh, um, a family has three or four sons and one of them passes away. Uh, and and the, the parents are old. You're not too concerned about the parents. But if all of the children die, then you're more concerned about the parents because you recognize that who's going to take care of them. 
Because generally, how does life happen? The parents die first. The children take care of the parents, and then the parents die. That's usually the way it happens. Not always, but usually that's the way it's supposed to happen. That our children are supposed to take care of us. That's one of the reasons why if you were barren, that you were kind of considered cursed, because in your old age, you'd have no one to take care of you. That's also why, why the, the, one of the Ten Commandments was to honor your mother and your father. Honoring your mother and your father wasn't just saying yes, sir, and, and yes, ma'am, but it was actually taking care of them when they became older and they needed something. It was your responsibility to take care of them and provide for them. Uh, and that's, that's what you were supposed to do. And so he, he, uh, Jesus has compassion for them. And one of the things that this needs to help us understand is what it is that or who it is that you and I need to have compassion for as well. If we are God's people, then the individuals that you and I need to have compassion for is not necessarily some guy who's homeless, who's able to work, but doesn't choose to work. If you want to give that guy money, you can give him money. But that's really not an individual that, that is considered destitute. He's destitute because he refuses to work. He's a sluggard. And God says that, that you, you leave a sluggard alone because his appetite is designed to get him to go to work. His appetite is designed to make him go do something. But when they receive money all the time, then they're not going to have any reason to go out and want to do anything. And that's part of the problem with our culture today is it kind of rewards individuals who don't want to work and individuals who are on drugs and individuals who, who have problems because in our culture, we don't want anybody to suffer as a result of their consequences. And so we need to make sure that we take care of them so they don't suffer as a result of their consequences. But God put those consequences in the world to teach us. So the reason I'm telling you all that is because that's why Jesus felt compassion for this lady. I guarantee you this wasn't the first funeral he saw. When I was in Central America, their funeral arrangements are different than ours. We embalm people. And so we might wait weeks before we actually have a funeral, and then everybody's, everybody, all the relatives come, and you know they they assemble, and and they have time for them to journey uh, to to where the, where the um, cemetery's at. <clears throat> Not uh, in third world countries. In third world countries, when you die, they bury you in the next two days, because if they don't, you're gonna you're gonna stink, and so it's quite common for you to be in Central America and see uh, see a funeral going by. So I guarantee you this is the only funeral Jesus saw. But what he's teaching us is who, who we're to have compassion on. Because you can't keep everybody from dying, right? Yes. I've heard it said from the teacher who was teaching uh, group seven in the past that you could, you could get from these two stories that Jesus did not like funerals. Okay, right. <clears throat> yeah, he, he, he doesn't like funerals. He keeps raising them from the dead. Or at least not, not this one. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and because there was a lot of people who died during Jesus' day, but he, he didn't raise very many. He only, he only raised a, a couple. Lazarus he raised, this one he raised, and he raised a 12-year-old daughter. And those are the individuals he raised. He could have raised everybody, but he didn't. So Jesus didn't come to take care of physical death. Jesus came to take care of the consequences of death. That's what he came to take care of. But in this case, this woman would be left destitute, so Jesus had compassion on her. And we're to understand that that's part of the mission that we're to do. In James chapter 2, where James is talking to us about the difference between being a hearer and a doer, he tells us in, in verse, uh, I'm sorry, James chapter, chapter 1, not 2. In James chapter 1, and down here at the end of the chapter, in verse 26, where he's talking about the difference between being a doer and a hearer, he says in verse 26, if anyone thinks himself to be religious, in other words, if you think you're a religious person, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. So he says, first of all, if you're religious and you don't bridle your tongue, in other words, you don't watch what you say, you're not concerned about how you speak to people, you're not concerned if you cuss or tell dirty jokes, then your religion is worthless. And then he also says in verse 27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and the Father is this, to make sure you go to church every Sunday and read your Bible and pray every day. Oh, wait, yours doesn't say that? That's what people think today. That's what people think religious people are. Religious people go to church on Sundays, and religious people pray all the time, and religious people read their Bibles. But that's not what it says here, is it? Here's what it says. 
Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. God says our goal is to relieve people's afflictions. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to relieve people's afflictions. Now, he doesn't take care, he doesn't take care of, of death, not in the physical sense, because we're all going to physically die, but he does take care of the, uh, of the consequence of death, and that is whether you're going to spend eternity with God or not. But Jesus had compassion on this individual because this would have been an individual who, as a result of the death of her son, would be left destitute and would uh, need somebody to take care of her. And so Jesus was making sure that she'd have somebody to take care of her. And I'd suggest to you that that's the reason why Jesus took care of this individual at this particular time. And so in verse 13 of Luke 7, it says, When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. So they're, they're coming. This is her only son. This is the, the last living person in her physical family. And Jesus says to her, Don't weep. Well, he's not being insensitive. What he's saying is, Don't weep because I have a solution for you. I'm going to take care of it for you. Uh, he's not telling her or he's not telling us that when somebody dies, we shouldn't weep. When, when Stephen died, the Bible says they made great lamentation over him. They, they wept for him and, and they lamented for him. Now, we don't lament and weep like the world does. When the world weeps and laments, they say, oh, we're never going to see you again. Your life is over, you know, forever and ever you're gone. That's not the way we weep. We weep the same way you weep when you're, or, or maybe you don't, but we weep when our children go away to college and we're not going to see them and we're sad. Or when friends that, that we've known for a long time are moving away and we weep because we're not going to see them. Uh, we're not weeping because their existence has ended. We're weeping because we're going to miss them. And that's the kind of, of weeping that goes on. So Jesus isn't telling this woman, don't weep. And you're not supposed to weep when somebody dies. Uh, but we don't weep like the rest of the world. But in this particular case, she's not to weep because God is going to take care of her and God is going to help her, verse 14. And he came up and touched the coffin. Now, it is unlawful for a Jew to touch a dead body or a coffin. They become unclean. There's only one place in the scripture where it says that if you're unclean or you're, you're, you're not uh, clean, uh, that you become clean by touching something. And that is when you touch the sacrifice on the altar, you become clean. Because the only people that were supposed to touch the sacrifice of the altar were the priests, and they were supposed to be clean. And so if you're touching it, you're clean. Well, that's interesting because every other time, if you touch something dead, and by the way, the sacrifice is dead, but if you touch any other, any other thing that's dead, you become unclean whether it's your parents, whether it's a dead animal in the road, whether, whether it's, it's, you know, roadkill. If, if you touch somebody who died of, it, uh, of themselves, then you become unclean. And Jesus comes uh, and, and he touches the coffin. He touches the coffin. And so you can kind of imagine the shock of him touching the coffin because everybody who was, who, would there, who was there would probably be around the coffin, but would be careful not to touch the coffin, except for the relatives that are carrying the coffin or, or the closest friends that are carrying the coffin who have decided that they're willing to be unclean for a day while they take care of this process. But everybody else would kind of be standing back, but Jesus goes up to it and he touches it. And that suggests to you that's why everybody stopped. Everybody was like, what are you doing? Why are you touching this? Okay. Uh, and the bears came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. What we see here is Jesus giving life to this dead guy. Now, I just told you that in the Old Testament, if you touched something unclean, you became unclean, right? Right? If you were a Jew and you touched something unclean, you became unclean. That, for some reason, is still our philosophy in the church, you might go, well, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is we're not supposed to hang around sinners because they're going to make us unclean. 
So we make sure, and, and we don't have any, any non-Christian friends. We don't go to any non-Christian places. We don't go to any parties where they might do, be doing stuff that we shouldn't be doing. So we avoid every kind of contact from dead, unclean people. Jesus went and touched an unclean person. He went and touched something unclean. Well, why? Because God makes things clean. God makes the unclean clean. And our job as a Christian is to go out into an unclean world and help them become clean. And the way we help them become clean is not by avoiding contact with them, not by coming to church and making sure the only people that we associate with are church people, and we never, never go out in the world and do anything where there might be people who are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. We're certainly not going to go out there because we might become unclean, and that's the exact opposite philosophy of what we have in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we, have, we go out in the world we go out and we associate with the world, just like Jesus associated with sinners, for the purpose of helping them become clean. And how do we help them become clean? Do we touch them and make them clean? We bring them to Jesus who can make them clean. But if you don't go to them, guess what? You might remain clean, but what's going to happen to them? They're, they're going to be unclean for the rest of their lives, and we might have been the only person who might have helped them to become clean, but because our church said, don't associate with sinners, and don't hang around those guys, and don't do that stuff. Well, don't do that stuff is true. But we say, we sometimes tell people, don't go to places where there might be sinners, because if you do, you're going to get unclean. And we fail to understand that as Christians, we help people become clean. That's what Jesus did. Jesus did the very opposite. And sometimes that's the difference between religion and being God's people. Religion tells us to do certain things to make us look religious when Jesus is trying to get us to be loving and caring and concerned about other people. And so uh, it says, and he came up and he touched the coffin and, and the bear came to a halt. By the way, if you're having trouble with that, just in case you are, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where it talks about a man who married his father's wife. Remember that? Jesus said, now that's the guy you're not supposed to hang around with. You're not supposed to hang around with a Christian who's actually doing sinful things. In, in, verse, in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 11, he says, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or adulterer or reviler or drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such an one. Now, before that, in verse uh, in verse 9, he says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and the swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. See, God left us in the world so we could be an agent of cleansing. Okay? Yes, sir. even religious people don't understand Jesus. She said she highly respected her grandmother. And her grandmother asked her what she did last night. And she said, well, I went to a dance. And her grandmother said, do you think Jesus would have been there? And the answer is yes. He would have gone to a wedding too. But it convicted her and she never went again. That's what happens. We, we make all these religious rules that keep us from doing what God said instead of doing what God says and making sure we also don't do what God, what God tells us not to do, not what religion doesn't tell us what to do. <clears throat> and so it, it halted. Jesus touched the coffin, and, and the bears came to a halt, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. It's always interesting that when Jesus uh, uh, raised somebody from the dead, he always specified which person. Somebody once said, because if he didn't, everybody would rise from the dead. And that's probably true. And so Jesus says to the young man, I say to you, arise. Now, here's what's interesting. If this guy's dead, how can he hear? Well, God can make him hear. But the point is, he's not really dead. His spirit is alive. His body is dead. He's basically telling Jesus is basically telling the guy, come back into your body. 
Arise from the dead. Get up. Come back into your body. <laughs> because the spirit doesn't die, at least not until the day of judgment. It depends on your view of that. But in Luke 7 and verse 15, he says, And the dead man sat up and began to speak. Now, how does a dead man get up and speak? I always find those interesting, right? Like, like the blind man who could see. Wait a minute. If he's blind, how can he see? Jesus has all these paradoxes for us that he gives us. Because when you come to God, he changes all the paradigms that we have in our thinking and, and the way we view things. He says, the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. That'd be kind of scary, wouldn't it? I mean, it's scary to hear him set up and speak. I, I can imagine, I visualize the whole crowd. <laughs> yep. Could you imagine being in a morgue and all of a sudden one of the corpses just sits up and starts speaking? What? Yeah, at the door. That's right. Yeah. right. We're out of here. Right? Uh, and by the way, it's not like Jesus ran around raising a bunch of people from the dead. Like I said, in the gospel, there's not a lot of places where Jesus raised somebody from the dead. There's a few. There's very few places where God, Jesus actually raised somebody from the dead. So it's not like this is going on all the time. And, and, and so the young man uh, or the dead man sat up and began to speak. Wouldn't you, have, wouldn't you love to know what he said? What did he say? What were his first words when he came back to life? Hi, Mom. <laughs> yeah, well, where am I? <laughs> where am I? Who am I? What's going on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why did I come back? You know, who, who brought me back? Well, what in the world did he say? Uh, that'd be interesting to, to, to know. But anyway, so he began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. When you notice that phraseology. Jesus gave him back to his mother. Anything we have has been given to us by God. That includes your children, your husbands. Everything that we have has been given to us by God. And God can take it away if he so chooses. That's the story of Job. The story of Job is God can take away whatever he wants and he's still right. Our job, our duty is just to be faithful to him and serve him. And so he gave him back to his mother. Jesus gave him back. And now she had somebody who's going to take care of her, somebody's going to provide for her uh, until she died. And <clears throat> Jesus is doing that with Israel. Israel basically had become a widow. When they went off into captivity, who did they lose? Their king. They lost their leader, their husband. They, they lost their husband, right? Jesus comes over here, and in order for Jesus to save them, what does he have to do? Oh, yeah. What happened to this young man? He died. And how did God take care of this, this widow lady after, he, after her son died? We raised him from the dead, and then the son could take care of them. What did Jesus do when he came over here? He died. And what did God do to take care of his bride? Raised him from the dead. See, there's more in these stories than just Jesus raised somebody from the dead. He's trying to help, he's trying to help us understand how God takes care of us, how God's going to take care of the of his family over here that was over here without, a, without a, a, a leader, without a father, you might say, without their shepherd, without their king. And Jesus comes along, and he's going to take care of them. But he, like this young man, has to die, and God has to raise him up and give him back to his family or his bride to take care of them. And so Jesus gave him back to his mother. And verse 16, and fear gripped them all. And they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And I want you to notice two things here, or a couple of things. First of all, fear gripped them. Uh, I think we can understand that, right? Uh, but was, was this fear a reverential fear for God, or was it fear as in, this guy's doing weird stuff, right? So they... they the, it says, fear gripped them. They began glorifying God. So they glorified God, saying, 
a great prophet has arisen among us. So how were they glorifying God? What? They were no. Maybe. What? Maybe. No. They were recognizing that here. They were recognizing that Jesus is God's prophet. Remember I told you when the book of Luke and all the gospels begin, we begin, other than the story about the virgin birth of Jesus and that stuff that's kind of done in secret that we only know about because the, 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 record, the, the record told us about it. Nobody, we, we, would, we would never have known about the birth of Jesus if it wasn't for the apostles and those individuals who wrote it down for us. We would think Jesus was just a regular kid that was born into the world. So as Jesus is this regular individual born into the world, people saw him as a man, and the gospel's goal is to get the people to go from he's a regular man to he is God. Well, they're not quite there yet. They're not there yet. Where are they right here? He's a prophet. Glorify God, he's a prophet. Yeah, but he... He's a prophet. We glorify God. He's his agent. We glorify God. You know what's interesting to me? Is Jesus did tell one person that he was the Messiah before they acknowledged it themselves. You know who that was? The woman at the well. That woman who was married five times and was living with a guy that we would have made sure we stayed away from because look at her life and look at how many men she's had and look at how, uh, 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 look at the kind of life she has. And so we would make sure and stay away from her because she's as dead as dead can be. And yet she said to Jesus, I perceive you're a prophet. And then Jesus said to her, oh, she says, I, uh, we know that Messiah will come. And Jesus said, I'm he. She's the only, she's the only person he told. Everybody, everybody else had to acknowledge it first. She's the only one he told. It's got to tell you something. Yes. Well, Sure. That's right. Well, they glorified God because a prophet had been given. See, they didn't say the prophet is God. They said he's a prophet. Remember, remember when Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Oh, they say you're a prophet. They say you're, you're John the Baptist, maybe. He said, but who do you say that I am? What'd they say? You're the Christ. You're the Son of God. Not a Son of God. You're the Son of God. You, 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 are, you are God's DNA and God's makeup here in this world. You are God. That's what they're saying to Jesus. And that's why Jesus says, and upon this rock I will build my church. Could be, yep. So, Richard, did you have something? They were shocked. Yeah, they were shocked, yeah. Either way, whether they, whether they, they were looking at the power, whether they're looking at just somebody raised from the dead, they were in shock and, and fear gripped them, but they began glorifying God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. So they're saying God has visited his people. Now, this expression, visited his people, is the same visit that's used over in James chapter 1, where it says pure and undefiled religion is to visit the widows and the orphans. How did Jesus visit this widow here? Did he go to her house, sit down and have coffee with her? He gave her what she needed to survive. 
He didn't just go sit at her house and visit with her for a few minutes and, and notice that her fence is torn down, but he walks by and leaves it, or that her house, house needs to be cleaned, but they just don't care, or the roof of her house needs to be taken care of, and they don't care. They, but they did their duty because they went to go visit her. They sat and had coffee with her, and then they left. The word visit means to care for, means to provide for. It means to give them what they need. That's what the Bible talks about when it says we're to visit one another. We're to be concerned about one another's needs, and we're supposed to help one another in those areas in which we need things. Yes. I had another text from that too, uh -huh. where they said God had visited the people. They still didn't realize that God was living among them. Right. Exactly. He just came down and visited them. Right. Yes. There you go. Help. That's right. That, that's the word visit. The word visit. That's right. The word visit means to do something for them to help them in their situation. Some, sometimes people go, well, Mike, do you run around and go visit the widows? Yeah, they need something. But there's not a lot of times when I go and sit and have coffee with them and somebody says, well, you're supposed to. Well, probably. But uh, you want to know the visiting preacher here? It's Bill. Bill visits with people more than I do from that standpoint. But Bill and I and Greg and Loretto, we all care about the widows. We want to make sure they have what they need. We want to make sure that they're, that they're not in any other kind of need. Uh, and, that, and so we try to help them. But visiting is not just having a cup of coffee with them. Visiting is actually uh, providing for them and taking care of them. Yes, Brother Bill. And just clarification, Bill includes Linda. That's right. Bill includes <laughs> Linda. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, if you ever get a card from Mike... You know it's from my wife, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, it says, a, a, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. Now, verse 17. And this report concerning him went out, uh, went out all over Judea and all the surrounding districts. So Jesus is getting more and more popular, especially as he raised somebody from the dead. Now the, now the grapevine is really buzzing with news and information about what Jesus is doing. And so you need to notice those little statements because it indicates that Jesus' popularity is getting, is getting better and better. It's kind of like this chart here of, of John, where here Jesus' ministry starts to crest. It starts to get more and more. People become more convinced about him being the Messiah, not necessarily God, but that he's the Messiah. And then all of a sudden we see his ministry going down. So that's part of what you have going on here. Now, in Luke 7 and verse 18, uh, anything on, on that uh, on that little story, anybody wants to add or mention? Be interesting how TikTok is doing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Luke seven verse eighteen then goes on to say, "And the disciples of John reported to him about all these things." So the disciples of John are with Jesus, especially at this time, because Jesus uh, John is in prison. So when John is in prison, if your religious leader is in prison. And there's another religious leader that your religious leader likes. What are you going to do? You're going to go hang around that other religious leader until your religious leader gets out, right? That, that's what's going on here. That, that's why he says the disciples of John reported to him, John, about all these things. That, that's why they're reporting these to John, because John is in prison. Remember, he'd been locked up in prison because of Herodias. Okay, So he's in prison. And the disciples of John reported to him all these things. And summoning two of his disciples, so John's in prison, he calls two of his disciples, and John sent them to the Lord saying, are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? Well, wait a minute. Wasn't it John in chapter 1 of the book of John who told us that, uh, who testified about who Jesus is? In John chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent him uh, priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, what then? Are, are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he said, no. Then they said uh, to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. Well, what do you say about yourself? And he said, I'm the, uh, I am a, a, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. So, Jeremiah, so John says, I am the forerunner. Now, as the forerunner, he's going to identify who Jesus is. Okay? 
Uh, and it says uh, in verse 29 of John 1, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him. John saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He says, He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, how did he know that? He says, This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing in water. In other words, John is saying, I didn't know he was the Messiah. Now, he knows who Jesus is. How does he know who Jesus is? It's his cousin. Jesus' cousin. Martha, Mary and, and Martha are related, right? And so they knew each other. They would, knew who, they would know who they were, but, but John didn't know that Jesus was the one. John probably heard some stories from, his, from you know, Martha and, and Mary about, about the birth, but they didn't have any idea that he was going to be the one. So, I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Yeah, I said Martha, didn't I? Yeah, it was Elizabeth. Sorry, my mistake. Um, so, in, in verse 31, John 1, 31, it says, I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing water. In other words, John says, one of the reasons that I came baptizing in water was to identify the Messiah. That's why I came. So he baptizes somebody, and he goes, nope, you're not the one. Baptize another guy, nope, you're not the one. Nope, you're not the one. Nope, you're not. Now, they're being baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, so, you know, he's doing good. But he raises them up and goes, no, you're not the one. 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 He's looking for the one. Um, kind of like in the Matrix. He's looking for the one. Okay? And so verse 32 says, and John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. He says, now when I baptized Jesus and, and I brought him up out of the water, all of a sudden something strange happened. The Holy Spirit came down like a dove and sat on him, and a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. And, and, and verse 32 says, John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Well, if John said, I testified to you that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the one, then why in the world is John, did John summon his disciples and tell them to go ask Jesus, are you the one? You know why he did that? Because their concept of, of the coming Messiah was what? What was the concept of the coming Messiah? I'm sorry? Well, yeah, no. He was going to be a physical ruler who would destroy their enemy, who would destroy the Roman Empire, and allow them to become rulers of the world, and he would sit on the throne of David. Oh, that sounds like the premillennialist, doesn't it? Sounds like what they're teaching. <clears throat> but John is in prison. John is going, wait a minute. If you're the Messiah, and you're supposed to conquer our enemies for us, and I am a good guy, why in the world am I in prison? Maybe you're not the one. Maybe you're going to do something else for God, but maybe you're not the Messiah. Maybe you're not the one who's going to deliver us from our enemy because I'm sitting in jail. That's what John is thinking. I am sitting in jail. And matter of fact, the, the account in Matthew actually says that, that while John was in prison, he sent two of his disciples. And so this is going on while that's happening. And he sends two of his disciples and John uh, sent them to the Lord saying, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? God, I went to the doctor today, and he says, I have cancer. Are you really God? Do you really care about me, God? If you're God, why in the world am I going through cancer, Lord? I'm one of your faithful servants. Why is that happening to me? If you're God, how come you let me have this financial trouble? That's not my fault. Well, that's a good question. 
Why is John sitting in prison? That's what, that's what John is asking. Are you the one or should we look for somebody else? Let's see what happens. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry, Marguerite. Who? Oh, oh, John had already recognized and said who Jesus was. He told his disciple who Jesus was. He's the Lamb of God. Takes away. He's the one I saw the Spirit descending on like a dove. John already knew all that. I'm sorry? Now he's in question. Why? Because his concept of what the Messiah is coming to do does not fit with what's happening in his personal life. His personal life is, I am being arrested by the enemy. I am in jail. And Jesus is supposed to be my deliverer. He's supposed to be the one who's going to save, save us from our enemies. Why in the world am I in jail? Hmm. Maybe he's not the one, but maybe he's come to do something different. So he says, are you the one? In verse 21, or verse 20, and when the men came to him, that's the men that John sent. When the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? In other words, is someone else coming after you? Okay, by the way, that's what the Muslims think. The Muslims believe somebody, somebody came after Jesus. Jesus was supposed to come and establish God's kingdom, but he didn't. So God sent uh, the prophet um, Muhammad, and he's the one who was able to establish the kingdom. So Jesus was not the one. Okay, But here, John, uh, they're asking Jesus, are you the one? It says in verse 21, At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he and gave sight to many who were born blind. And he said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Well, wait, 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 wait. And then it says, then it says, when the, mess when the messengers of John had left, what was his answer? Did he say yes? Did he say no? Well, what did he say? You know what he said? He said, look at what God has told you about what's going to happen when the Messiah comes. What did God say was going to happen? See, one of the things that you and I need to understand is you cannot convince anybody of who Jesus is without the Word of God. you got to have the Word of God in order for you to prove who Jesus is. You can't just say to them, do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Well, if you just tell them, do you believe in Jesus? They go, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Why are they believing? Why are they believing? Because you told them. Because you told them. Now, what happens when you do something wrong in your life? They go, I'm not going to believe him. I'm not going to believe that person. So Jesus must not be the one. And that's what happens a, a lot of times when our children go off to college. The parents tell them, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. They go, okay, I believe in Jesus. I go to church. Yes, great. And then, and then they go to college and they get all this evidence that says there's no God. And they go, well, you know, my parents told me that I would that he's God, but all this evidence tells me he's not, and they don't have any evidence from God to indicate that he is God in the flesh. Jesus says to them, look at what I'm doing. Look at what you see in history. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the, the, the blind eyes are open, and, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now you go read what the Old Testament says and you tell me if I'm the one. And so all of those passages, by the way, that I gave you in your booklet for you to look at in chapter 7 in your booklet, all those little, chap all those little verses there to help us know something about what's going on here, 
Like, for example, in Isaiah 35, Isaiah 29, Isaiah 61, those are all the places where it says the blind are going to see, the lame are going to walk, the lepers are going to be cleansed, all those places, and all those places have one thing in common. What's that one thing in common that Isaiah is writing about right here? Now, they all have one thing in common. Well, they all happen, but when, John, when, when uh, Isaiah was writing them, what's the context of each one of those? Every one of those have the same context. What is it? Well, yeah, the, 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 the sick are healed, the, the blind are, have their eyes. It's Messiah is here. Messiah is here. The good news is here. The good news is here. By the way, the good news is your God reigns. And so if you want to convince somebody of Jesus, you have to start off with the evidence. Yes. Back to your comment about the Muslims that say Jesus was the Messiah. My son was studying with Mormons one time, and he kept questioning about evidence. And one of the elders looked at him and said, you're just really hung up on evidence, aren't you? Yeah. I said, yeah, I am. That's right. Yeah. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So God's word says when Messiah comes, the blind are going to see. When Messiah comes, the deaf are going to hear. When Messiah comes, the dead are going to be raised. When Messiah comes, the, the gospel is going to be preached to the poor. Jesus said, Jesus said, what is happening in history right now? What's happening in history? The blind are seeing, the lame are walking, the deaf are, are, are hearing, the, the uh, um, crippled are walking, lepers are healed, and the gospel is being preached to the poor. Is Jesus the one? Yes! Yes! And that's why it's by... Faith. It's by faith. faith. Faith is based on evidence and what actually happens in history. That's why when somebody says, well, I think Bigfoot is real. I go, well, I don't have any evidence yet. I don't have any concrete evidence that tells me that Bigfoot is real. Maybe he is, but I don't have any evidence. So how in the world can I believe it? Yes. Right, exactly. People have to be, the Bible says people have to be taught by God, not by the preacher, not by the church. They have to be taught by God. Well, God's teaching them right here. God, by the inspiration of the prophets, told them what they were supposed to believe. And so when, when John is there, and one of, the, one of the really wonderful things about this is it doesn't matter how I feel. See, no matter how I feel, it doesn't change this. I might, I might be a person who runs through depression. Maybe I, maybe I have a problem with my, there's some wrong with my physical brain and body, and, and I, I, I'm just kind of depressed from time to time. It doesn't change this. It doesn't change it. Because these are facts. Now, how do you make sure nobody has the facts? Don't let them read their Bibles. Tell them you don't need it. Tell them you come from monkeys, so why in the world do you want to read that? It's old. You can't trust it. You can't believe it. You're silly if you read it. You're silly if you depend on it. You've got to be intelligent like us. And Jesus is telling his disciples. Go and report to John, verse 22. What you have heard, the blind receive sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Now, 
He says, blessed is the one who doesn't take offense at him. What does that mean? Okay, what does that mean? It, uh, it's kind of like when you say, why is God allowing all this to happen in the world? And if you get offended by that, because, well, I'm not going to believe anymore in that, because look what's going on. Or God took my child away from me. Or what kind of God would do that? If right. God, that's right. If God doesn't fit into your paradigm, then you're going to either have to change your paradigm or you're going to stumble. If God doesn't fit into your thinking, you're going to have to do one of two things. You're going to either have to leave God so that it doesn't bother your thinking, or you're going to have to change your thinking. John's in prison. John is going, if he's the Messiah, why am I in prison? And John needs to change his mind. He is the Messiah. There is a reason why I'm in prison. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing with my life. If God wants me in prison, even though he's the Messiah, then I just need to trust God. If I have cancer, God is the all-knowing. if I have cancer, I have to believe that God knows what he's doing. By the way, if you haven't read the book of Job, that's what it's about. Job says to God, Naked he came into the world, and naked will I leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And when he gets boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, he says, do we only accept good from the Lord and not bad? And he resigned himself to the fact that God is Lord, and he's going to do whatever he wants to, and our duty is to believe and trust him that is for his glory and our good. And I am personally glad that I have the story of Job. Because without it, I might have doubts. God gives the people what they want. He allows things to happen. That's right. He allows things to happen. Yeah, that's right. So verse 24 said, When the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowd about John. So we'll start with that verse 24 next week as we talk about the rest of what the writer's talking to us about so that we might be able to better understand his will. All right. Any... That's, that's next week or when the next time you get that's, back. Yeah, next time I get back or the next time. If, uh, if Loretto wants to teach that, he can certainly teach that. And uh, wherever Loretto leaves off, that's where we'll pick up next week. All right, let's have ourselves a prayer. Any questions or thoughts? All right, let's have a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for every blessing. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins that we have in your son, Jesus. We're thankful for the hope of eternal life, and we're thankful, Father, that you are the God who loves us, who cares for us, and who doesn't just want us to believe just because of belief, but you want us to have evidence. You want us to have a basis by which we can know for certain that we can build our house on you. We can build our house on the kingdom that you provide for us and that we can build our house on those things that we cannot see. And we trust, Father, that you and your son are those who rule and that your Holy Spirit will guide us in all that we do. We praise you and thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen.